Hi, everybody. Before we start this week's show, we have to let you know that it is a special summer compilation of all the most wonderful stuff that, for time, space and legal reasons, we have not been able to fit into shows over the last few months. Hang on a second. So we're releasing a whole show that was legally dubious. This is the end of No Such Thing as a Fish. <laughs> we, we're we going to be sued by uh, Figs, the people who run the Fermi Lab, Russia. All of these things are mentioned in the show. <laughs> And my catchphrase this week is balls, balls, balls. So listen out for that. Is it? In what context? You heard it a few weeks ago. You'll hear it again shortly. No, no wonder that was cut. <laughs> All right, on with the show. Balls, balls, balls. <laughs> There is a there's a theory that we only have hands because of figs. <laughs> so I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it's that our hands evolved as tools for assessing whether figs are soft or not. Okay, so uh, this sounds insane, but it's a proper theory from a Dartmouth really? paper. Okay, and what chimpanzees do in the wild, they squeeze fruit just like we do in a supermarket to work out whether it's it's good. Go do that, Andy. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Don't do that now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fine. They squeeze fruit like we used to until four months ago in a supermarket. which And that might have helped us develop fine motor control because chimpanzees get a massive advantage from being able to squeeze fruit because they can do it four times faster than if they have to detach it, bite it, and then assess it, right? So they mm. can tell much faster. Like birds and monkeys, they have to rely on visual information or on oral information, i.e. eating a bit of it. Yeah. So chimpanzees have an advantage there. Um, and do they maybe... ever do the thing where um, they squeeze it a bit too hard, they put their thumb through it, and then they try and bury it under some other figs and pretend that they haven't oh touched God. it? <laughs> this is why you shouldn't squeeze stuff in a supermarket, guys. <laughs> Every time you squeeze an avocado, it's making it bruised for the next person who comes along. Or if you put ah. your thumb through it, then Eventually it'll be perfect, though. Eventually it's perfect for the 40th or 50th person who touches that avocado. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, there are so many fruits. You've got to do the squeeze test. Oh, no. Also, I can't believe they've never used supermarket fruit in crime solving because every item is covered in fingerprints. Just a thought for the Met. <laughs> well, yeah, great but thought. They, but- Thank but you. it's not as if they're getting to a crime scene and they're going, should we dust the avocados? No, no, don't waste your time on that. Like, what do you mean? I think why, what I'm why... saying is you go to a crime scene, you find some fingerprints, then you go to the nearest Tesco and you dust all the fruit. Yeah, no, exactly. Sorry, good. sorry, that does work. And yes. then you cross-reference it with a CCTV of who's been in the supermarket. It's a genius idea. Everyone goes to the supermarket, apart from the Ocado killer. Um, <laughs> they would get away with it for years. <laughs> There's a lab in, uh, it's, is it called Fermilab now? The, the part of physics guys in America? Um, it was called the National Accelerator Lab back in the day. And in 1971, they were testing their particle accelerator. Um, so, you know, it has huge 13-ton magnets all the way around this four-mile ring. And they, they noticed that it kept failing and it kept messing up because the magnets were kind of being pulled into the vacuum tubes and they were leaving these little metal slivers inside the actual uh, tube, which is meant to be all empty. So how do you get inside those tubes to empty them out? Uh, how do you gain access? Um, do you cover yourself in butter and then slip in? Well, you're too big to go in. You have to send something into the tube. A child? A ferret. A ferret. Ferret. A ferret. They it's always a bloody a ferret, ferret, isn't it? Always. Into a particle accelerator. They <laughs> sent. They got a ferret called Felicia for thirty dollars, and um, she didn't want to go. She had to be trained with progressively larger tubes because they just started off by putting her at this like three hundred foot tube, and she said, oh, "I'm not going in there, obviously." And then she. So dragged... it was a talking ferret. A yeah, talking yeah, ferret, yeah. and she was still only thirty dollars. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> she could only talk after she came out of the particle accelerator. They don't know what happened in there. Um, yeah, but then she, she, pulled th- she pulled it through and then they were able to attach a cleaning swab and they clean it properly. And very sadly, she died the following year. Oh, uh, hmm. But knowing that she'd been of use to mankind, which is what yeah. the ferrets want. Well, so she was at a sanctuary. I think she might have died. Because do you remember we talked about how female ferrets die if they don't have sex for a year? Come on, if you've just been in a particle <laughs> accelerator and you can tell that story, you are getting a lot of sex. 
<laughs> hey, um, garden gnomes, are they basically the replacement of hermits? Did we did we do them out of a job when the garden gnome was invented? No. There's debate. I believe there's debate about this. Right. Okay, some people point out that they live in your garden and they're, they're bearded and weird. And then other people say, no, that um, they are flamboyant and they like showing off and they're clearly not like hermits at all. They're just both kinds of people who like to live in your garden. I don't right. know if they're flamboyant. I can't believe we've stolen this debate from Newsnight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found, because I, I just very quickly, I, when I was reading about hermits and they said that gnomes had replaced them, um, I discovered that one of the most notable producers of gnomes was a man called Tom Major Bell, who was the Prime Minister John Major's father. Ooh, really? Was he? Really? Yeah, he was one of the most notable. And he, so he had a company yes. called Major's Garden Ornaments. Major's oh. Garden Ornaments. And yeah, and that took them from being quite a sort of not well-to-do family to becoming middle class. I mean, effectively, gnomes are the reason that John Major became prime minister. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm speculating there to a no, huge I degree. No, I think that's but fair. I think that's right. That's incredible. Yeah. Didn't he then become a acrobat or something no yeah he was that was his was, previous no. career that was yeah. he he was whole life he was a circus performer and an acrobat and <gasps> i'm sick of people laughing at me in the, my circus job i'm going to get into a serious career <laughs> <laughs> and that's supposedly where this is just a bit of trivia but supposedly where david bowie got major tom from because he saw on a poster tom major um so major tom of the Ooh. space oddity song but yeah so garden gnomes gave us a prime minister Wow, it really does take David Bowie down a few rungs of cool knowing that that mm. song was written about John Major's dad. <laughs> well, actually... Uh, I don't know if he'd want that broadcast. Here's what's even weirder. The first ever David Bowie song was The Laughing Gnome. That was his first single. Wow. Mm. Yeah, That's just, a gnome just suddenly realised that. Yeah. Spooky. Well, there's that, there's that church as well that I think we all probably know about, which was called the Sand Covered Church. No. Um, and what was oh, special is, about that? <laughs> so uh, this is in Cornwall and uh, an encroaching uh, sand uh, dune or just a whole cover of desert was heading towards it. And um, this church slowly got covered up and covered up uh, by sand that it got to the point where no one could get into the church itself. So they were constantly having to dig the sand away to get through the door. Wow. There's a story that um, the victim Vicar was once uh, lowered once a year via a skylight into the into the church so that he could perform a once a year sermon. I actually can't find any uh, <laughs> sources for that except for QI, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when, when was this done? Was it recent? Or was it um, 19th century? Or? No, 19th century, yeah. Wow. yeah. And it's a very old church. It still stands as a sort of restored version of it, which is just the steeple sticking out of the ground now. Um, and the rest of the church, presumably, wow. still Can I ask what series it. of QI was it on? Was it before I started? Or? Yeah, no, it was actually um, part of the uh, Telegraph articles um, that used to be written by QI. Oh, elves. yeah, I used to write uh, those. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, your name's not on this one. All right, luckily. <laughs> Can I just ask, Dan, if the vicar's being lowered in through a skylight to give a sermon, to whom is he giving that sermon when presumably no one else has entered through the door? He's a missionary converting the death worms. That's the thing. <laughs> See? I have a feeling it was a symbolic thing. They had to do it once a year to sort of um, claim that it was still a church. It was, it was something along those lines. Yeah, it wasn't to a there, congregation, yeah. though. Um, I think that would really increase the church attendance, which is a worry often. If your vicar flew in through the roof every time he gave you a sermon, like that's cool enough that I might start going to church. Yeah. Did you know, Just this is just on the Public Health England report. So there's this report in 2017 that said you've got to reduce sugar in cereals. But I read the report and bizarrely, um, it divides food into various categories and Kit Kats and Penguin bars are not chocolate bars. Mm, that like was biscuits. a what? weird fact I found. Yeah, they're biscuits. Oh, is this, this is normal news to you guys, is it? No, 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 I, just, no. I just was making a leap to what else it could be. I kind of half agree that Penguins maybe aren't chocolate bars, but I feel the same. Kit Kats, yep. bang on chocolate bars. Bang Absolutely. on chocolate bars. Yeah. Look at the Kit Kat Chunky. Yeah. It, it specified bar. two finger Kit Kats, actually, so it could be that the Kit Kat Chunky was elsewhere. Mm, still a biscuit. Yeah. It still also cited under chocolate, chocolate confectionery as an example the chocolate lollipop, which I don't think I've ever had. Is that a thing? Sounds great. I have, never had one. I have some in my house, some chocolate lollipops, and I have a big bowl of Dum Dums in my house. Like, there's about, mm -hmm. probably about 200 in there, and some of them taste like chocolate, and they're the worst ones. I thought you meant Dum Dums, the explosive bullets used in the assassination <laughs> attempt on Ronald Reagan. I was going to say, James, <laughs> edit this bit out. 
I thought you meant pacifiers because I've got a shitload of those as well. <laughs> Dum Dums, you know, they're like, um, what are they called? Chupa Chups, but American versions of Chupa Chups. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Mm. Fair enough. Um, um, have, you, have you guys heard of the Golden Mole Award? No. 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 Okay, so this is uh, this was set up in 2016 by NPR and specifically um, inspired by the fact that the Golden Mole does have this rainbow shine on its fur and doesn't know it. And they, they talk of it as being accidental brilliance. The mm. fact that they have no idea it's there, they are accidentally brilliant. And so the Golden Mole Award for Accidental Brilliance was set up by NPR. And the idea was to award scientists who made accidentally brilliant discoveries when they weren't looking for the thing that they found. So, for example, there was um, a biologist called Shelley Adamo who was trying to study the stress levels in crickets and in order to do that, she introduced a predator, which was a bearded dragon. And the idea was the bearded dragon was meant to just scare them by being around them and she could suss out the stress. Um, but the lizard accidentally passed on a virus which infected the crickets. And the crickets, um, gave it gave the crickets this insane libido and they started mating. And it was suddenly discovered that it was a parasitic aphrodisiac and they had no idea that this lizard would ever have the ability to pass on something like this to crickets and make them have sex so accidental brilliance as a as a discovery and it champions all of these great moments for scientists who've had these little situations and it happened in 2016 and it's never happened again i don't know why they stopped it it's such a wonderful idea for an award oh i thought you meant the so the awards never happened again sorry yeah the awards the golden mole awards as far as i can tell have only been awarded in 2016 and then that's it they retired it as a and do they have any theories about why it's an aphrodisiac because it could be like you know if if i was there with my partner and then there's a huge herd of lions coming towards us on the horizon (laughs) which i guess is the equivalent i guess you'd think sod it might as well right get another shag out before we're torn to shreds. Is that what they're thinking? Um, we don't no. know. I think Dan specified no. it was a parasitic organism yeah. which jumped from the dragon <laughs> to the crickets. So that's one theory, is the organism. <laughs> but is the other theory that you only live once attitude? No, no, you're right, you're right. Screw Shelley Adamo and her biology degree. We should have the Anna <laughs> exactly. That's probably why they stopped the award, because everyone just went, well, that's a stupid theory. <laughs> Your theory yeah. about the parasite. I know you found an actual parasite in the crickets, and I know you can see that it came from the dragon, and I know that you've given it to other crickets and they do exactly the same thing. I know all that, but what about... But clearly, yeah. clearly the yeah. crickets are just going carpe diem. Get on it, literally. This experiment, um, we didn't quite go into it then, I think, right? So mm. uh, basically what they had was like a big perspex circular tank, Um, with two walls so the sand dunes could go around the circumference of the circle, right? And they could kind of chase each other, and it was like a wind tunnel that sent it round. Uh, But the guy who did it was called Carol uh, Batsik, or Carol Batchik, uh, and he works at Cambridge University. And the reason that he did this experiment is he was just looking at one um, sand dune going around this thing, and he's thinking, this is boring. It's like, <laughs> it's taken ages like to get any kind of, um, any kind of data. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to double my capacity and put two sand dunes in, and then <laughs> I could get twice as much data. I'm just going to do that. And then when he did that, it started a new experiment that he hadn't intended to do, which was to see how the two interact with each other. Do you so think cool. when he proposed that, people said, you're batshit crazy? Because <laughs> his name it's, is Batchik. Which it sounds like, yeah. yeah. Yes. I, yeah. I thought I thought of it immediately when you said Batchik, and then <laughs> your explanation was so good, but so I, I didn't realise it would be that long. And so <laughs> gradually there became less and less point in making the joke. <laughs> it's, well, it's good you've shown us you're working. <laughs> yeah, and it's nice that you held on to it. Uh, I, I think it's important his... to explain why you don't get a laugh um, <laughs> when you don't. <laughs> his name sounds like a colloquial term for COVID, really. Batsick. We should all just say we're batsick. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, just wow. more catchy. God, if I wasn't going to cut Andy's joke out. <laughs> In 2005, Alaska Zoo had an elephant which... Um, was very she was kind of uh, overweight because she was in captivity she couldn't walk she you know um so they had a problem here so how would you solve that um you would give her a treadmill 
Exactly. <gasps> they did, they built the first, and as far as I can tell, the only ever world's elephant treadmill. Wow. wow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. They got a company which does heavy-duty conveyor belts for mining, <laughs> and they, they put that together, 22 feet long, <laughs> um, could support this 4,000-kilo elephant. Wow. And um, this was September 2005. The headline was, now, to get the elephant on the treadmill, okay? The next headline from the same website was... Elephant scorns her treadmill. Oh, oh, oh no! <laughs> she hated it. She never got on, got fully onto it once. Wow, what? I can kind of empathise with that. Everyone hates treadmills, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was later moved to a sanctuary in California. But guess what happened to the treadmill? It was used for different animals. Um, mice, okay. but like five thousand of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you're kind of, kind of close in a way. It was bought by a dog musher. Oh, really? for oh, cool. and it, for his whole dog team. That's great. Right. God, that's a fat dog you've got. I don't know how that's managing to run across the Arctic if it's the same weight as an elephant. No, it's a no, full pack of dogs. No, it's a pack of dogs because it's it's a twenty two foot it's, long it's one. Big. It's a pack of dogs. That makes sense. Not one obese dog that they were trying to bring the weight down. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> They had the one particular one, uh, a Russian mission, actually. So this is after the fall of the Soviet Union. They kept hurling probes at Mars. And the Mars 96 Russian mission was carrying 200 grams of plutonium. And it was going to use it as a power source, but obviously an incredibly radioactive element. And it uh, messed up, as so many of those probes do. And so while it was trying to escape the Earth's orbit, it failed and it broke apart. And then there was just this satellite carrying plutonium, which would be incredibly dangerous if it broke up anywhere on the planet, uh, that was spinning around around the Earth. And all the countries of the Earth were kind of watching it, like um, like watching a roulette wheel. And at one point they thought, I think it's going <laughs> to land in Australia. It's going to land in Australia. And oh Clinton, like Clinton called up John Howard in Australia and said, OK, I'm really sorry i think you're going to be hit by some plutonium we'll help you out don't worry about it and then it sort of missed australia (laughs) and then the official report went out that it landed in the pacific ocean which was weird because about 200 people in chile said that they'd seen something burn up in the atmosphere and crash into the ground (laughs) and they've now sort of admitted that it's probably somewhere on the border of chile and bolivia and if you see something don't don't do anything with it it's a bit like past the parcel, isn't it? Where it just keeps going round and keeps going round and you don't know when it's going to stop. <laughs> yeah. Like the earth is just... Or actually, it's more like... Do you remember those games where it's like a water balloon and you keep passing it around to everyone and eventually it blows up in your face or something? No. I've never done that, how, no. Ha- no. How has the water balloon <laughs> exploded in this? Like, is there explosive I, I think in it's the water in balloon? Like, I think it's in like a piece of plastic or something. I don't really know. <laughs> you know what this is? This is a game which you could buy when I was um, a teenager or younger and um, we weren't allowed to have it. So I only saw it in adverts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, wait. I think I remember the adverts because I think in the middle of the water balloon is an unstable isotope of uh, uranium. That's and that right. uh, might decay at any point, which will make the balloon go pop. <laughs> Uh, quickly, some stuff on wrestling or not? Oh well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some funny wrestling nicknames. Yeah, mm-hmm. oh, okay. There's yeah. lots of lists online of um, good wrestling nicknames. Uh, Jimmy Wang Yang. Nice. No, I've never heard of him. No. <laughs> Beaver Cleavage. Amazing. Beaver Cleavage. Beaver Cleavage. Wow. Is it, are these desirable attributes for a wrestler? Why do you want a Beaver Cleavage? What even is that? Is there a dam on it? At the time, there was a TV show called Leave It to Beaver. Apparently. I don't know what it was about, but apparently oh, yeah. it was so- his name came from that for some reason. Have you heard of um, <laughs> Balls Mahoney? He was <laughs> no. another wrestler. His fans would shout, balls, 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 while he punched his opponents. Where did he punch them? Uh, I haven't got that written down. Because uh, it feels like a request, doesn't it? <laughs> Can I just mention the possibly real-life animal whisperer who Dr. Doolittle was based on? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, so we're actually not sure about this, but his life resembled Dr. Doolittle's in a way. And it turns out that it could be that Dr. Doolittle is the same person as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. No way. Wait, Wait, so he's, so do- he's three people? <laughs> That's so funny. If he drinks yep. one dose of the potion, he turns into Edward Hyde, a psychopathic murderer. But if he drinks two, he turns into a sort of charming animal doctor. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cool. But he keeps on mixing up the potions, and that's where the essential comedy of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and Dr. Doolittle, the original text, but lies. Isn't Mr. Hyde like almost an animal creature in himself? So, like, he would oh. be able to talk to him, to his animal <laughs> self. Yes. To himself. He had to, that's why he had to invent Dr. Doolittle to talk to Mr. Hyde. Um, no, none, none of that's true, except for the fact that we think both characters are based on a Scottish surgeon called John Hunter, who was one of the leading surgeons of the 18th century. He was very famous. Um, and this is just based on similarities in his life. So he really liked animals. And he was also a grave robber. So the grave robber <laughs> thing is a bit more Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And the liking animals thing is a bit more Dr. Doolittle. Uh, it's, but it's weird how they don't a- mention the animal talking in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Hyde and they don't mention the grave robbing in <laughs> Dr. Fuller's <Fuller> time. <laughs> so weird. They're just different genres, aren't they? Um, but Hunter had over 3,500 animals. Uh, wow. And he, he was, a, some of them were dead. Wait, and uh, were, most so... of them, were most of them flies? I mean, <laughs> narrow that, it down. <laughs> that would be cheating. He had one dog, no. one horse, and then 3,498 flies. <laughs> he had more good ones than that. He had two leopards. So he lived okay. in Leicester Square and he had two leopards who lived in his garden and once got loose and ended up in a fight with some local dogs. <laughs> and he had to what? had to restrain them. He kept a pet bull in his house, which he used to wrestle for fun. Hang which on, is great. All, all in central London? Yeah. He, all in central London. He used to live yeah. in the... There's a pub that I think is called the Moon Over Water or something like that, which is on Leicester Square, and that was his house. And at the back of his house, he had a massive sort of place where he cut open bodies and stuff like that. I think if it's the right person I'm thinking of, I think it was. Yeah, Yeah. there's that place where he cut bodies and then where he talked to his pet rabbit next to it. (laughs) It's nice. Uh, he actually did keep a lot of bees, so maybe that was where some of the cheating came in, mm, Andy. Okay. Uh, one of his friends explained that he befriended the bees, and especially the less well-known kinds. Mm. And this is the guy who might have been Dr. Doolittle. And I did read that he died of heart disease that was complicated by syphilis, which he may have given himself when he inoculated his own penis in his studies <laughs> on gonorrhea. Oh, wow. To get syphilis from yourself is pretty bad, isn't it? That's, that's annoying. I mean, that's yeah. an excuse, isn't it? When you go home to your wife and she yes. says, where did you get syphilis from? You think quick, think quick, think quick. Oh, I inoculated my own penis with gonorrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> yeah. Where did you get the gonorrhea from? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I'm trying to get rid of chlamydia. Oh, God. Damn it. <laughs> Just one more loofah thing. I found a really fun loofah patent. So I was going through all the patents looking for loofah, the word word search loofah. And (laughs) so there was one in 1889. So this is just when they were taking off. Someone invented the loofah sock puppet. And the idea is that, you know, loofahs full size, they can't get into those hard to reach spots. Mm. So behind the ears, for instance. And so a little sock puppet loofah was invented. You could scrape behind your ears. Oh, Let's yeah, see. and similarly, more than a hundred years later, what sounds like something very similar was invented in 1994. There's a patent for a finger-mounted toothbrush. Also, a great idea: stick a bit of loofah oh over the end God. of your finger. I've seen those. Don't they? Don't they sell those in motorway service stations? Yeah, I'm sure yeah. I've... There we go. Maybe That's it took off. And... Quite yeah, a few yeah. times. Yeah, quite a few times I've been stuck in sleeping in a service station and I've had to get myself one of those toothbrushes. Your marriage is on the rocks, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's incredible. It's thought that the patent itself says toothbrushes require a certain amount of dexterity to get in the mouth and it's easier if you just use your finger. But yeah. some people will have short fingers and, and long mouths. No, come on, Andy. I can touch my back too, just about. But Not many people are going to have such short fingers or such long mouths <laughs> that they can't reach some of their teeth. That's, that's a very small amount of the population. But isn't the point that the toothbrush, like, if your hands are dirty, your toothbrush is clean, whereas if you've got to get to the very back of your mouth, you've been rolling around in a loofah field. Well, well that's true. You know, yeah. wash your hands, guys. If we've learned anything for the last three months. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I will give you, Andy, that this wouldn't work on crocodiles, for instance. But I I agree that most humans are correctly proportioned. Or Tyrannosaurus rexes. So difficult. What about a horse walks into a bar and the barman says, why the long face? And the horse says, it's because I've not been able to clean my teeth for a week because of this new hoof brush I've got. (laughs) It doesn't work. Um, Just while we're talking about sort of other bizarre... Uh, transportation uh, from the early days. Uh, I was looking into the 1920s. I found a motorised baby carriage 
uh, that was used uh, in England. Uh, this was to get that. So that had on the back a sort of nurse chauffeur who would stand on what was a motorized baby carriage. So you can see pictures of it where the baby is laying in a bassinet and they're standing on the back as if on a little platform. And it had an internal engine, which they said was really nice for um, sort of creating a little buzz and hum. You know how babies fall asleep in cars? It's kind of Mm. giving it that kind of vibe. And it could go up to four miles an hour. So people would just be nurses on the back uh, traveling with their babies. Yeah. Did the nurse stand on the back? Was it like being on a Segway or something? Or were they walking? Exactly. They were standing on the back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, When was that done? So, yeah. It was in England. Sorry, when? This was in the 1920s. Yeah, 1920s. And I I found this one other thing, which um, I think this is one of those prototype things. We have a photo of it. I don't think it got anywhere very far, but it was a man in LA who wanted to sit while walking. So he wanted transportation to do that. So he effectively invented a unicycle which was instead of, so he sat on a seat, but instead of it leading to a wheel, it led to two other legs that when he spun the pedals would walk the legs underneath his legs. So he was sort of eight foot tallish and these legs, which had proper shoes on, would be walking underneath him, but what? he would be sitting and pedaling. And, it's a bizarre he, and he, but he's, he's pedaling the legs with his own legs. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's pedal, using his legs to pedal some legs that are below him. So it's all the the disadvantages of cycling, but with the pace of walking. <laughs> yes. It's basically all the worst parts of cycling and all the worst parts of walking. Yeah. In, in one. <laughs> <laughs> it makes I'll a hell of a catch photo. on. <laughs> So Mozart, when he came to London, um, was actually a bit of a disaster because he was he was brought to London with his sister Nanelle and his father, and they kind of launched this big promo campaign to make him the sort of superstar child, along with his sister. And people just didn't believe it; they just refused to believe that a genius <laughs> that young could be that talented. And um, and so there was a sort of promotional backlash. Everyone in the papers was like, "You're just a you're a hoaxer, you're a fraudster, can't be true." So weirdly, he ended up playing in a pub in london wow. uh you know this sort of he went from he, he played for the king initially and then by the end of his his time in london he was playing in a tavern that's a good open it's... mic night isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah imagine going on after mozart yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some owls do farming they cultivate other animals to eat did you know this uh no, no. You know about the burrowing owl? Is it, uh, you, you, I'm sure you've come across it. It, it, it burrows on the ground instead of um, living in trees, yeah, okay. like an idiot. But um, it has a little burrow, and it takes dung into its burrow and then eats the dung beetles. Um, so oh. it slightly cultivates dung beetles so that it can have yeah. something to eat. I don't think it burrows, though, does it? It steals burrows. What? Yeah. The burrowing owl does not burrow. It's a big old misnomer. Oh, my goodness. It nicks other animals' burrows, so it It burrows lives... burrows. It bur- it's a burrow burrower. Should be called the burrowing owl. <laughs> yeah. um, so it will live in the burrows of prairie dogs or badgers or squirrels. Owls never make their own nests. They're very lazy. Wow. And they collect, yeah, they collect all this dung. So not only does it nick these people's homes, but then it collects loads of poo and piles it up at the entrance to attract the beetles. I think it's quite a clever idea, isn't it? Because if someone steals your burrow and then mm-hmm. you go and try and get it back, but they filled it with poo, you're probably like, all oh, right, fine, you can have it. Fair enough. Yeah, there is one other owl which does this, which is um, I haven't found too much more evidence of this. I've only got a little bit, but it's it's the little owl, which I can only assume based on its name is absolutely massive, because <laughs> um, it, and it stashes meat and then supposedly grows maggots from the meat. Ooh. Really? Or lets maggots develop in the meat for its own food. Yeah. Wow. Because that's wow. more that like one farming. line in another article. To me, that's hey? more like farming because the other one is more like fishing for. Uh, dung beetles, mm. isn't it? You put some dung out and the dung beetles come along and you yeah. yes. reel yeah. them in. But this one is actually growing maggots. Yeah. That's like farming. That's incredible. <laughs> we should stop propagating the idea that maggots can grow on something. You know, that idea was debunked about 200 years ago, what? I think, guys. <laughs> what if I got this lion's corpse in my living room and I'm just waiting to get the bees out of it? <laughs> What a neat yeah. joke about Tate and Lyle. Yeah, exactly. You're going to have to look up golden syrup cans to get that, everyone. Um, during World War II, the BBC banned uh, Perry Como's Deep in the Heart of Texas during work hours, so you weren't allowed to play it 
um, from wow. nine to five. And the reason was that it's got a little bit where people clap along and they were worried that people who are working in ammunition plants might <laughs> clap and drop the bombs. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah. I mean, so was it the wow. case that if you dropped a bomb, it exploded? Because if so, I think they need a better health and safety on the bombs. You're right. <laughs> it doesn't feel like that would happen. Another ammunition factory has exploded based <laughs> off one person dropping a thing. I suppose probably it was just that they it was distracting the workers rather than they might blow themselves up. I don't know. I think bombs are... Enc- you're encouraged not to drop bombs, aren't you? That's... Yeah, I imagine if I got a bump that came over from Amazon, I hope on the box it would say, do not drop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Confusing, though, when you're in a plane actually ready to drop the bomb and you see that little label <laughs> on the side. <laughs> um, yeah, before, um, before champagne came to um, the world, before Dom Perignon started selling his um, champagne, we always drank Perry, and that was it was fizzy... Basically, I mean, baby sham tastes a bit like champagne. It's like almost so, the same yeah. thing. Uh, and we were drinking it 150 years before um, champagne was invented. It used to be one of the main drinks. Dom, Dom Perignon, right? Brilliant. So Brilliant. good. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Not worth interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Hey, I read a cool yeah. pie fact the other day. Sorry for the tangent. Okay, go on. Uh, just very quickly, no, but pie, if you look at it in a mirror, it's 3.14. Spells pie. Yeah. 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 Well done. It's good. It's great. Welcome to the party. <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? I didn't know that. I remember the first time I learned that, yeah. Yeah, it me was, too. It was quite a day. I'm sorry. A big we were just talking pie and mirrors. And I brought <laughs> I know, something no, no. completely relevant. It's four backwards. Four backwards. Oh, I guess it looks a bit like a yeah. pea. No, yeah, I see. We it love now. it. I okay. think we're just saying that we, because you sort of like, sometimes have seen that done that in school and been really excited by it when you're 11 i'm just ah. excited that you're having that moment now well i, I went to a steiner school <laughs> yeah <laughs> if you if you put the number um 58,008 into a calculator and turn it upside down it spells out boobs get out of no i did know that one <laughs> i did know that one okay. i'm all over boobs and boobless and boobies <laughs> they teach boobs at the steiner schools they do <laughs> that's what we got <laughs> Do you know the saying, bringing owls to Athens? Yeah. It's like bringing coals to Newcastle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a much classier version of bringing coals to Newcastle because the owl was the emblem of Athens. And so, yeah. I say bringing samovars to Tula. Do you? (laughs) It's like bringing samovars to Tula. (laughs) That's just another version of that. Um, I don't know where Tula is and I'm not... 100% 100% of what a samovar is either. I thought you were talking Latin, but I've just realised that that's... <laughs> I think it's in... Is it in southern Russia? I don't know. I don't. I actually don't know where samovar is either. Might be in Georgia. Where Tula is. I think where? samovars Tula. are everywhere. I don't remember anyone's bought a samovar. I think what is clear is that I'm using this phrase, which I don't understand at all. <laughs> <laughs> there were some happy endings in P.T. Barnum's acts, right? So um, there were a few nice stories. There was a woman called Katie Brumbach, who became known as the Great Sandwina, who was just amazing. I actually can't believe she existed. So she was a famous strong woman. She came from a circus performing family and she trained to be strong from an early age. And she beat Eugene Sandow in a fight. So Eugene Sandow, I actually don't think we've ever mentioned him, but he was the champion strongman of the 19th century. He was like the first strongman, wasn't he? You know, if you ever see pictures of these Mm. kind of really muscly people holding up barbells, he's basically what they're all based on. Yeah, I think the actual trophy for the Miss uh, Mr. Olympia is based on his body. Um, Yeah, he's the father of modern bodybuilding. Wow. There you go. Well, it should have been this lady, the great Sandwina, because in 1902, she'd heard all this chat about Eugene and she did an act where she'd call men up from the audience and invite them to fight her and they all thought they could beat her and none of them could. <laughs> and Eugene Sandow fought her. Or they, yeah, they actually had a competition to see who could lift the biggest weights and she yeah. won. So wow. there was a 300 pound weight, which is like t- a 22 stone man. Like if you're that overweight, there's a documentary about you kind of level. <laughs> and she raised that up above her head, I think, with one arm and Eugene couldn't even get it up, like, over his chest. That yeah. is, a, that is really amazing. That is incredible. It's unbelievable. Because you can yeah. imagine being able to beat someone in a wrestling match because you have different skills or something, but lifting weights is, like, literally just muscle mass, isn't it? Really, yeah. that's yeah. all it is. So, wow. Yeah. She, she met her husband after kicking his ass in a wrestling ring. 
<laughs> he was he was one of the people who accepted the challenge to try and fight her and his memories are basically walking into the ring and then nothing and then blue sky above him <laughs> so wow. she knocked him out and um they fell in love afterwards and yeah she had a she had a loving relationship with him yeah 52 years i wonder how much um he had in the decision <laughs> how much <laughs> <laughs> I do, yes, anything. Yeah. <laughs> just one more thing, and we probably won't use this, but it's so interesting, I just want to say it. And that is that um, one more thing is that skates, you know, the fish, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they use incubators on their eggs. So they lay eggs, like um, sh- some fish, like sharks, for instance, they also do it. They lay these things called mermaids' purses, which are essentially their eggs. And the skates they intentionally put their eggs next to hydrothermal vents, which is a bit at the bottom of the ocean where wow. heat comes out, wow. like volcanic heat. And they nice. deliberately, they don't put it directly next to it because it would boil the eggs. They put it just the right distance away that it as- accelerates the speed in which the eggs um, kind of uh, grow. That's genius. Essentially. And so, so they cool. have their own artificial incubation, even wow. though they're fish. And if you have left it a little bit too close, then you can just do the old take the top off egg and soldiers. (laughs) Soft boiled egg. (laughs) What would you dip in if you were in the water? You'd have to get some sort of passing shrimp. Your soldiers, your your bread's (laughs) going to be soggy, isn't it? (laughs) I always think, so there's been this debate about whether we need sharp knives, like pointed knives at all now. And this is a point that I think... Oh my God, Anna, for fuck's sake. We have this conversation (laughs) literally on a weekly basis. (laughs) Amazingly, you can't believe you're using this as an excuse to bring up this argument again. You've cut it out every time, James, and if you keep cutting it out, I'll keep bringing it up. So, here's the debate, listeners. Please take your votes. Um, it's thought we don't really need the pointy end of sharp knives because we don't really use that. We use the sharp bit. But when do you use the point? Now, James, weirdo James, shoves the pointed end into his tomatoes to cut them up. What I say is just use I, a serrated knife. Well, you know what? Literally yesterday. I, <laughs> you I was, stabbed someone with a pointed knife. I know. I was cutting some sourdough bread and I stabbed it before I did the cut. And I thought Anna would not approve of this. <laughs> <laughs> there is a pear called a stinking bishop. Do you know that one? No. Yeah. no. Is, is that related to the, the cheese? cheese? Yeah. Exactly. So those two things are related. And how are they related? Same bishop. <laughs> like poor guy, Same poor thing. stinky old bishop. <laughs> um, kind of, but not really. No. Okay. Uh, Ooh, is, um, okay. So, is it you often eat if you're in the 1970s apple and um, cheese on a stick? You do. So, yeah. is it related to that? Uh, no, it's not that. Yeah. <sighs> it is that stinking bishop cheese is made with perry that's made from the stinking bishop. Pear, and that's how it gets its name. Wow. Oh, cool! Isn't that well, the pear came yeah. first. Yeah. Really? The pear came first, and you make some perry, some alcohol out of it, and then you steep the um, milk and the cheese in that stuff, and it helps it, you know, helps the bacteria grow, and that's how you get your cheese. That's Amazing. very, Fair. very cool. There was there was a story as well about a guy who accidentally swallowed one of those um, iPhone. Head pod. I'm wearing one right now, these new oh, yeah. um, earphones. I notice you're only wearing one, Dan. Where's the other? <laughs> I am that guy. We'll see in two to three days what's happened to the other one. <laughs> yeah, so he swallowed it, and then you can do a tracker thing where it can locate um, your headphone. I've not actually used that yet, and oh. he apparently, he says, heard the beeps. Um, from within and he passed the <laughs> headphone and it still worked and it still had 40-ish percent left on it by the time it came out. No way. That's amazing. That was not an Apple product then, surely. (laughs) (laughs) They were offering trips to go and see the Titanic recently, I think. In fact, there was supposed to be a a sort of tourist thing this year, which I imagine is not happening anymore. But this is Stockton (laughs) Rush, uh, is this guy who's, I think he's like the CEO, a guy called Stockton Rush, who's the CEO of something called Ocean Gate Expeditions. And he's offering tourists week-long trips to go down in submersibles to visit the Titanic. And it's the first time since this couple got married that they've offered it to anyone. Uh, So they used to until I think about 2012. And each seat costs $105,000, which is exactly the inflation adjusted price of a first class ticket on the Titanic. So that's nice. Wow. Or it did initially. And he liked that sort of symmetry. 
Uh, but then he yeah. actually had to raise the price because he realised that it wasn't expensive enough. Uh, <laughs> I never realised it was that expensive to go on the Titanic. That's an incredible amount of money to go. I it's, mean, yeah, unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's huge. Um, first I class, know. I guess. They were forking out. Yeah, I know what you mean, but 100, 100 grand to go yeah. on a boat. Mad. It's not just, yeah. James, it wasn't just the boat. It's not just going out on your mate's boat. Okay, it was the but... boat. <laughs> Anyway, it had to be postponed this trip, first of all, because it's supposed to leave from the coast of Canada and it's a Norwegian ship that he's like got to take these tourists out in so they can go down to the Titanic. And there's all those weird shipping rules. So Canada suddenly said, oh, wait, your ship's going to be flying a Norwegian flag. You're not allowed to leave our um, coastal waters flying a Norwegian flag. So he's put hundreds of thousands of dollars into this expedition. And then there's a flag issue, which wow. sadly many had to postpone. Take and your so, flag down. What, what's his problem? <laughs> I would have thought, just repaint it. Paint a maple leaf on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a feeling that the rules are a bit more complicated than that, Dan. <laughs> I think when you have a flag of a country, there might be some paperwork to fill in rather than just going, fuck it, I'll put a different flag up. I don't know. Nah. Sometimes the simplest solution is uh, the one that's disregarded. <laughs> I'll give them a Zoom call. I'll, uh, I'll consult. Um, where's Wally Bucks? Yeah. Mm. You know those things mm. where he's in different parts of the page and it's a very busy page? Uh, yep. They are based on a German trend called Vimmel Builder Books. Uh, which is literally a teeming picture book. And the idea of those was originally you would have a picture with loads of stuff happening in all the different parts of the page, and it would be a child's job to kind of make stories up about all the different people who are living in the oh. different parts of this page. And so it's like a really creative mm. way of of um, teaching children how to use really? their imaginations. Yeah, isn't that, that cool? That is great. That's cool. Wow, so we've dumbed down Where's Wally? Well, we've triple dumbed it down because we think they kind of come from uh, paintings by Bosch and Bruegel and you know those amazing pictures like the Garden of Earth yeah. Lights or whatever it's called where there's just stuff happening everywhere it's kind of based mm -hmm. on those cool. and then we just oh. looking for some idiot with a stripy jumper <laughs> and sometimes there are loads of other people wearing stripy jumpers in the same page it's so crazy <laughs> It's it's why really are they hard. all at the beach if they're wearing stripy jumpers? It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. In real life, Wells Wally at the beach would be really easy because he's the only one in a jumper. Mm -hmm. That's, That's true. true. Where's Wally? At the, you haven't played the the master edition, which is Where's Wally nudist edition. <laughs> 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 um, very popular in germany that one <laughs> my favorite animal that lives on sand dunes is the saharan silver ant uh, and that's because this is one of the fastest ants in the world maybe the fastest ant in the world it's so fast it can run at 855 millimeters per second which believe me in that ant world what? Yeah. is super fast i was gonna say i could run at 855 <laughs> millimeters per second just about <laughs> yeah well can you run 108 times your own body length in a second no i don't think i can yeah exactly can you do <laughs> he does 47 strides per second Wow. Okay, so that is wow. uh, Michael Johnson, the old runner who um, he had a kind of weird way of running where he did lots more strides than normal people. And even he only did four steps per second. Ah. Uh, and this guy did 47 per second. So it's like, you know, those cartoons where you just see their legs going yeah. around yeah. in a circle. Yeah. It's a bit like that. I didn't know Michael Johnson did that. Did it look really <laughs> weird when you watched it? Yeah. Did it look like he had an extra <laughs> pair of legs? He was famously, he, had the, he ran in a different way than anyone else. So he ran really upright and he moved his legs really, really quickly. But presumably in really small, smaller strides, Is it like a ballerina tiptoeing across the stage. In smaller strides, yeah. Uh, can I ask a question about... Yeah. Okay, Michael Johnson, for example, yeah, yeah. if okay, if you came up with a new way of running, and let's say, let's just say that you came up with a way of doing forward cartwheels or forward rolls that happened to be faster yeah. than any other sprinter on the planet, would you be allowed to do that? It's or a is it cheating flop. to use your hands? It's a Fosbury flop, isn't it? Oh, you mean if can yeah. you use your hands to run? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a bit different <laughs> what than I'm what I was thinking. Say. If you ran uh, on all fours, like kids sometimes do. Yeah. yeah, actually, no, I think you can because. If you're in a running race and you fall over, yeah. like let's say you're in a steeple chase race mm -hmm. where you you're jumping over hurdles, if you fall okay. over and your hands touch the floor, you're not disqualified, are you? No, no. you're not. Yeah. So, That's right. um, yeah, I imagine if if you want to run with your, <laughs> with all four, give it a go. Arms and legs like a racehorse. I think you'd be go. able to. I'm sure okay, I've said great. before that I invented a new way of doing the um, walking race. 
um, which I, I believe is faster than the way that they do it in the Olympics. Wow. Um, it's extremely long um, strides and you move your hips a lot. And I reckon it's faster than anyone can walk in their style. Oh, but if I do it for about 10 seconds, I get unbelievably tired. <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, it, it might just not be very energy efficient, but it might be just that I'm terribly unfit. So, it, you know, it's, it's out there. If any, if any professional walkers want to hit me up. <laughs> Is there is there a hundred meter walk sprint? A, <laughs> Unfortunately, the shortest um, distance they go, I think, is about twenty kilometers, and the longest distance <laughs> I've ever gone in this technique is about twenty meters. Okay. <laughs> we could set it up though. Why don't we set up when we're all allowed back together? You versus Andy. Andy cartwheeling his way to the end, and you <laughs> walk sprinting your way to the end, and Dan and I will bring popcorn. <laughs> It's a shame if you have invented that new kind of run, like Michael Johnson has, that you have to expose it. There's no way that you can wear like a box around your leg <laughs> so that everyone's just going, what's he doing? Yeah, We can't, we can't work out why he's so much faster. Well, you could wear a sarong. Really Maybe that's what David Beckham was doing because he was a very fast <laughs> footballer, wasn't he? Um, maybe yeah, that's why he wore the sarong to conceal his trick of doing seven more steps a minute than anyone else. <laughs> but I think... The problem is, if you're wearing a sarong in the Olympics and you're running, then people will just assume you're on a unicycle. (laughs) (laughs) And so, yeah, they probably won't like that. Right, that's what they'd assume. You'd have to ritually take the sarong off at the end of the race to show that you had no wheels under there. Yeah. It's not, you just, you should just ban it altogether, sarongs, I think, in running races. It's not worth the hassle. Yeah, it's quite a tight wrap as well, a sarong. I would have gone a long skirt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite thick material. You're, no, you're rubbing you the face in it by... You need the massive box, that's what you need. A massive box, <laughs> a box. covering yeah. everything below the waist. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have anything else on sand dunes? <laughs> no. <laughs> I got one fact about pears, which I think is quite amazing. Do you know mm-hmm. the phrase, it's all gone pear-shaped? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. That phrase dates back to 1983, is the earliest we have an example of, and it was used in the Navy. Uh, And the phrase, it's all gone Pete Tong, is only four years younger. (laughs) Wow! So the, it's all gone... It's all gone Pete Tong was from 1987, and it's all gone pear shaped is from 1983. There's only four year difference. Isn't it great that? Yeah. You I wonder thought. what was going so wrong in the 80s that they had so many <laughs> other ways of saying this is Thatcher, screwed up. Thatcher, Thatcher. There you go. Yeah. Um, um, another time that a pear was an insult was this amazing period in 19th century France where it became this massive <laughs> political meme. This is It's the coolest thing. So this is in the 1830s. There was a famous caricaturist and political satirist called Charles Philippon. Charles Philippon. And he um, started publishing offensive pictures of the king and he was taken to court for insulting the king. And he said, how do you guys know that's the king? Look, I've even put someone else's name underneath it. And they were like, well, it looks like the king. He said, oh, well, that's, you know, you've made that assumption, not me. And then to to demonstrate you could interpret anything as looking like the king, he drew a pear and then he showed in four pictures how a pear could gradually transform into the king's face and anyway in, which is a pretty cocky thing to do in court and he didn't get away with it and he was sent to prison for a while but this became a meme for the king so like all these caricaturists and all these magazines published pictures of pears and that was a byword for how crap the king was and it was really wow. hard to prosecute wow. because they're just drawing pears yeah and eventually they cracked down on the pear image. And so what this guy did was he started writing. So at one point they were told to stop drawing pears. And if you had a publication and you'd had like a legal thing saying you weren't allowed to publish something, you had to publish that legal thing to be like, sorry, we did wrong. So he published what they'd been told by the government, but he published the text in a <gasps> pear shape, which looks that really beautiful. Brilliant. And it's, a, it's a real slap in the face. Wow. So good. He's asking for trouble, that guy, isn't he? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Oh. He is. And he was shut down. Another pair that looks like another sort of leader um, is the <laughs> new mini Buddha pairs. Have you seen those? No. This no. is a this is a guy in China. He's a farmer. He spent years and years doing this where he's been creating molds um, where the pear grows inside the mold. And for years, he's been trying to get it to look like a baby Buddha. 
um, and he's <laughs> and he succeeded. Um, he's got ten thousand of them, which he brought over to the UK. And you look at them, and it's like a little squished together Buddha, but it's a pair. And it's um, why? Why? I would imagine it's easier to sell a pair that looks like a Buddha than a pair yeah. that it's, looks like a it's pair. It's cool. It's yeah. just cool. And actually, yeah. no, you know those um, those soda and alcohol bottles where you get a pair inside. Oh yeah. I was yeah, trying to work yeah. out yeah, how, vaguely. how do you get the pear inside. Um, and the answer is you grow the pear inside the bottle from the tree. <gasps> so that's how no. they do it. Yeah, they hang the bottle upside down and they, they weave through the um, the branch and they allow it to grow inside. Then they cut that off and that's, that's really how they cool. get it in that's there. That's yeah. crazy. I didn't even know about the phenomenon of pears in bottles, but I'm still excited to know about how they do it. <laughs> that's so cool yeah it's not massive but you you do see them occasionally and they do the same thing with ships and bottles don't they you get the tree and then you put the, <laughs> yes. the branch in mm. <laughs> the ship trees he should call those pears i can't believe it's not butter yes beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well um, that's the kind of thing we cut out <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our collection of offcuts for this week. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We will be back again next week with another episode. Uh, until then, you can get us on our Twitter account. So I'm on that Schreiberland. James is at, at James Harkin. And Andy, you you like saying yours? I do. It's balls, balls, balls. Wow, really committing to that. <laughs> Wasn't worth the commitment. It's at Andrew Hunter M. At Andrew Hunter. Um, yeah, or you can go to at No Such Thing, our group account, or go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. We have all of our previous episodes up there, as well as links to bits of merchandise we've released over the years. Okay, guys, we hope you enjoyed that, and we'll be back again with another regular episode. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Goodbye. <laughs>